Good morning. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me today to be here with Professor Barry Zarrett in his beautiful house in Connecticut. Barry, as you know, was the first editor-in-chief of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology. Barry, we're going to miss you terribly because you can't make it to um, ASNIC this year, but thank you for taking the time to speak with us. And thank you, Prem, for making the trip here to Woodbridge, Connecticut. I will miss uh, seeing everyone and celebrating with everyone. It's a great pleasure. So, Barry, January 1993, so the first society that was dedicated to nuclear cardiology, and in fact, the only society still that's completely dedicated to nuclear cardiology was incorporated. And in less than a year, in January 1994, the first issue of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, the only journal, still the only journal completely dedicated to the field of nuclear cardiology was issued, the, the first issue. That must have been a tremendous feeling. What was it like? It was uh, incredibly exhilarating, Prem. Uh, when, as soon as the society was formed, Bill Nulligan, who was our first executive director, made a very cogent statement. And it was simply, if you want to be a real society, you need your own journal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, we took that very seriously. Jeff Leppo, the first president, and I were traveling back from Europe uh, from a meeting. And uh, after Jeff plied me with several drinks, he said, how would you like to be the first editor? And I hemmed and hawed, but after about the third vodka, uh, I said, let's do it. And that was the beginning. It, it was uh, a very intense year. It was uh, stressful at times, but we had our goals and we moved, we moved forward. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you drank vodka, wine with Dr. Lepo, it was the very best, right? Of course. Yeah. And the ideas he, flowed. He had us in first class at the time, <laughs> as he would usually do. Right. And, and do you remember... Um, what was published in that very first journal. It's a relatively short time, uh, a year after the Society was incorporated, to produce a journal and publish the first issue in a very young field at that time. There are some remarkably good papers, and I urge people to look back. Uh, uh, Carbon-11 acetate kinetics related to physiology, technical papers, in addition to the original papers, several very important reviews, uh, which became a hallmark of the journal. Uh, one of the stresses when you start a new journal is getting your colleagues to submit their best material. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't as yet an index medicus. We were brand new. This was the first, first uh, publication. Uh, and I had to call in a lot of chits, but I think I'm very proud of that first issue. So I recall that issue. Um, it, it was uh, authored by the who's who of cardiology and nuclear cardiology at that time. So you must have made very many telephone calls to, to, to achieve that, and including that first paper that you mentioned by Rob Beanlands. Now, I also remember that you wrote a very poignant editor's page for that first issue. Uh, what, what was the topic of that uh, edit editor's page. Well, in, in that editor's page, uh, I wanted to explain what we expected from the journal, the importance of the journal to the field, and why I was doing it. A and I started with a quote from the famous uh, Talmudic rabbi Hillel, the last lines of which are, if not now, when? And this was, in fact, the time. The society was new, the field was new, and it needed a journal uh, to form an intellectual backbone to move the field forward. And Barry, what were uh, some of the challenges? It's, it's always difficult to branch out into a new field and create a journal um, and, and succeed. Um, what were some of the challenges that you all faced uh, at the very early stages of this endeavor? Well, one of the biggest challenges was getting our colleagues to submit their best work to our brand new journal that wasn't even indexed yet, mm -hmm. rather than to Circulation or J Jack or all of the major cardiology journals. 
And uh, there was some reluctance to send the best stuff to us at the beginning. But I called in a number of chits and it worked. And within a year and a half, uh, we did get accepted into Index Medicus. And it's interesting, when uh, we first submitted after a year, uh, they said, uh, there may be too many journals. Mm -hmm. And do we need, an, is this not going to detract from the other cardiology journals? And that was their major concern. I quickly wrote to all of my colleagues who were editors of the other major cardiology journals. And with their very supportive letters, uh, we were accepted very quickly. And then that issue uh, of indexing was no longer a problem. And so you were the editor-in-chief for 10 years. And, and you stepped down, uh, handed over the baton to Dr. Beller in 2004. And those 10 years were a time of immense, even explosive growth in nuclear cardiology, a young field that um, grew to become perhaps the most widely utilized diagnostic test, at least for coronary artery disease. So um, what are some of your thoughts? And you have, you know, seen the birth of this child, if it were, and see it grow. Uh, what are your, some, some of your reflections on how the field has grown in the past several years? Well, the field has grown quite nicely. Uh, it still focuses predominantly on perfusion, mm -hmm. and that's something that over the long run, I think will change. I think we're seeing a lot more happening uh, with molecular-based imaging, uh, with metabolic-based imaging, and I think those advances will really give a much broader portfolio than certainly existed at the time that, that we were starting. And there are the constraints that we have now in terms of budgetary matters, bringing new radiopharmaceuticals to the marketplace mm -hmm. and having them used. And there is a certain nihilism or cynicism in terms of new advances uh, that will have to be dealt with. But it's been an incredible privilege to witness the development of a field from its very onset to its, its current role and place in, in our field. And you contributed uh, in a pioneering and extraordinary way to the inception of the field of nuclear cardiology. I'm talking about uh, New England Journal of Medicine, April 1973, the seminal paper that showed the world myocardial perfusion imaging using radioactive potassium with a rest and stress study myocardial perfusion imaging as we know it today. So tell us a little bit about uh, that experience. Well, it, I was working, uh, I was, this happened while I was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, I had gotten a deferment uh, to be a specialist and went in as a full cardiologist concluding my training. I had the good fortune to continue working with my good friend and colleague, Bill Strauss. Mm -hmm. We had been together as house officers in New York, as fellows at Hopkins, and now here in the Air Force. And we had done work together, and published some important papers dealing with ventricular function and radionuclides. And we were uh, at our little hospital at Travis Air Force Base thinking about what we could do. We, we were bitten by the research bug and we both knew this was going to be our careers, and what could we do doing our two years in the Air Force? We talked, and somehow the conversation went to uh, radioactive cations that had been used experimentally to look at heart attacks in dogs, and maybe once or twice in men. And we said, why can't we do this uh, with ischemia? By injecting under a different physiologic condition namely stress, physicals. At that time, it was exercise stress. Later, of course, it was pharmacologic. Uh, and uh, we just happened, that was it. Uh, we were able to get a, a small research grant from the Surgeon General's office. Uh, we were able to obtain radioactive potassium from a commercial source uh, down the road in Berkeley, California. Uh, 
We had patience, we had ideas, we had colleagues who were willing to support us, and it happened. The first one was like magic. We did our first study and there it was. This patient exercised on the treadmill, we injected this uh, very high energy isotope, scanned on a rectilinear scanner, which you'll only find in a museum. Yeah? And we saw this big defect and when we get an did another injection a few days later, it was all normal, at rest. So that was the beginning, the first patient, it was there. And then we accumulated our 20 patients very, very quickly and uh, began writing and began presenting. And uh, that was it. And it was accepted relatively quickly. And I remember sitting with Bill Strauss when we both were no longer in the Air Force at a meeting of the American Heart Association, and suddenly there was a whole session, a whole session from like 9 to 12 devoted to nuclear cardiology. I remember looking over at Bill and I said, I guess we did it, and that was it. And I'm going to show everybody this iconic picture of a young Barry Zarrett <laughs> supervising one of the first um, exercise myocardial perfusion scans and the rest really is history. And the technique went on to become, and still remains, one of the most, most widely utilized non-invasive tests in, certainly in coronary artery disease and probably um, in, in cardiology. Barry, you were also uh, ch chair of cardiology at one of the most haloed uh, divisions in the country at Yale. And uh, you were there for how many years? Well, I was chief for 26 years and uh, on the active faculty for 45. Mm -hmm. So that must have been a very busy life. It was very busy. And how did you juggle? And I know you're, you're, you're very devoted to your family and, and your children. And so how did you juggle all of this? Well, I guess time management and lack of sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I used to wake at uh, 3 30 in the morning have my coffee pot on timer immediately uh, grab that first mug run upstairs and work on the journal work on papers work on other things uh, then go out and run for five miles and get to the office at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was uh, very intense and uh, the, you can do a lot when you're young and you've got that fire burning in your belly I've heard you refer to this as a labor of love. It is a labor of love. The journal. Mm -hmm. or the, and, and all the work right. that you've done. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I think uh, I'm very fortunate. I, I came to medicine uh, without a background in my family of either illness or profession. Uh, it's just something that I knew viscerally was what I wanted to do. And I knew it was cardiology. And then I knew it was nuclear cardiology. And it's it's all come together. I I, I wouldn't have trade I wouldn't trade a nanosecond of my career, the good and the bad. And I I recall um, a very pioneering verse that that you published some years ago, um, and it and in it you said, uh, caring has replaced healing, and and soothing has replaced science. Now, you've had the from a vantage point of many years, you have witnessed growth and change, not only in nuclear cardiology, but in the practice of medicine. What, what has been your, what's your reflection now, looking back at all of that? Well, you know, it, that is from a, actually a poem rather than a paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very passionate about uh, patient care and have maintained it throughout my entire career with patients I followed for over 40 years. Uh, in fact, I wrote an editor's page uh, in the JNC called The Patient Behind the Image. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to write a poem about that same topic in, in the very near future. But uh, in certain ways, it's uh, like the opening lines, the classic opening lines of The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It's the best of times in that science has expanded so dramatically, technology has expanded. We've made such 
incredible strides. We can do things that were unheard of uh, when I was an intern at Bellevue Hospital in 1966. Uh, and that's wonderful. The price we pay for knowledge overload is perhaps loss of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And as we look at patient care today, too much time is spent at the keyboard and not enough at the bedside. So I've tried to devote a lot of my efforts in the past 15 years to uh, inculcate within our trainees a sense of the humanistic aspects of medicine. We can never forget that they're real patients. We're taking care of patients with diseases, not diseases. And so that verse I quoted uh, was from a very beautiful poem that you wrote called uh, The Jewish Home for the Aged. Um, and it's here in this uh, edition that, that you've published. So how many, how many books of poems have you published? That was the first of two books. My second book uh, was published this past fall. Uh, it's, the poem is called The Jewish Home for the Aged, but it's about one patient who has uh, spent the last five months of her life there, and I would visit her regularly. And uh, many of the poems in both books deal with patients with illness, but with many other issues as well. And uh, I'm pleased that uh, Amy Iskandrian, the current editor, has asked me to share many of my poems in the journal and they appear there regularly. Barry, the picture on the cover of this book of poems is uh, one that you painted. And this is what everybody sees when they walk into your house for the first time. Right. I. Yes, this particular painting uh, is a tree-line road from saint Remy to Arles. Uh, and many people will who've been to Provence recognize the actual road. And uh, I encountered this scene uh, on a trip uh, with my colleague and good friend uh, Franz Walkers and neighbor as well. Franz, Marianne, and Myrna and I went on this trip uh, about oh, eight to ten, probably ten years ago. Uh, and I uh, was pleased that I could convince the publisher uh, to put this on the cover of my book of poems. The same holds for my second volume as well. It's my painting on the cover. And so here we are in the study of Professor Barry Zarat, artist, poet, pioneering researcher, leader in cardiology, compassionate physician. You've had a very multifaceted career, Barry. What, what is your message to, to, the, to the young people of today? Well, first, before we get to the message, uh, don't write the eulogy just yet. <laughs> <laughs> I may have retired uh, about five months ago, but I'm still teaching uh, and still learning and have a very active production schedule for the next future, five, ten, or whatever, however many years there are. And just to show you, uh, let's walk over here. This is uh, an antique desk that I just purchased this fall, and it's here that I'm writing my poetry now. This was my retirement uh, uh, gift to myself. So perhaps one phase of life has finished, but uh, there are other phases that are going to continue, hopefully for quite a while. And As for my message? And your message. And your message to the next generation of, of, of cardiologists and nuclear cardiologists. Uh, there are several things. Uh, follow what your viscera tell you to do. Uh, we're all in science, we're all in medicine, but only you know what you really want to do and decide that and then follow that. What you're going to be doing for the rest of your life has to be your passion, your calling, not just a job uh, that gives you enough money to support your family and pay off your loans. And from a scientific standpoint, 
don't be afraid to take risks. Uh, high risk, high reward. Don't spend the scientific career focusing too much on the derivative. Try to make major contributions to your field. And if you think that way, you'll be there. Barry, thank, thank you. It thank was a you. pleasure, and thank you for speaking and to us this morning. And thank you for coming all this way. <laughs>